Okay, a lot of you will recognize the uh, picture of Table Mountain and uh, just in front here is Robben Island which gives a bit of a contrast. And I don't want to uh, uh, say too much in too many directions but this is a little overview. I'll give you a background and a personal view. And having said that, Terry, just to modify a little bit what you said, I was not born in South Africa. My, I was born in Switzerland and my family was born in Switzerland. They came to South Africa when I was a baby. So I grew up there, went to school there, went to university there. But as I'll mention, that did shade the way we looked at things perhaps. Like all histories, it's biased through the eyes of the person who sees it and relates it. So I've got to declare my personal biases. I'll say a little thing about apartheid. Life as a medical student, experiences in everyday life, experiences of apartheid activists, and I'll spend some time relating the Biko case, which was, was really a key case that shaped a lot of people's uh, futures, and then the emigration of the workforce. Apartheid was born in 1947 with the election of the nationalist government. My brother and I had to decide whether we would take our South African citizenship, I think it was at the age of 16 or 18, and both of us elected not to. And at that time, right until about 1960, we had to carry a little book, the Aliens Registration Act. So that when I went to university, I had to check in at the police station before I left East London. And within a week of arriving, I'd have to check in at the police station in Cape Town. And that was effective for uh, if you stayed at a place for uh, more than three weeks. Well, they would call apartheid separate development. It was separate development, but very much in favor of the white population. It was a morality based on race, and although I had my foreigner's pass, I was never asked for it in public, as opposed to the Africans. If they didn't carry their pass and they were challenged by the law, they could face prison. I should add, too, that a lot of the South African nationalist establishment uh, had been involved with Nazi activities during the war and that goes back to the Boer War where anything anti-British must have been good because the relation at the Boer War time between the Afrikaner and the Brits was deservedly pretty poor. Anyhow, uh, uh, that was one of the factors that influenced a lot of activities. The Cape where we lived is far more liberal, was then and is now far more liberal than the Transvaal, the Orange Free State and even the interior of Natal. So we had apartheid gradually squeezed on us coming from buses that were unsegregated to buses that became segregated and that kind of thing. I became politicized when I went to university and we maintained a liberal attitude at home but because of our Swiss nationality we did not take part in party politics. And the University of Cape Town, beautiful setting and you'll be pleased to hear that both UCT and University of Otago are on the list of the top 10 picturesque campuses. This you'll recognize, Hrutsku Hospital, the uh, old hospital up here, and the new hospital. This was uh, constructed after we left, uh, where we trained, and uh, that was the center for academic medicine in the Cape. While I was at university in 1959, the University Apartheid Act was introduced by the government. And the key part of the act said that it is a criminal offence 
for a non-white student to register at a hitherto open university without the written consent of the Minister of Internal Affairs. There was a big demonstration outside the library on the steps of the main hall at the university and uh, the flame of academic freedom was ceremonially extinguished on the 11th of June 1959 and a plaque was there to the effect of what had happened and next to it there was a plaque that said on and the date was left open the flame of academic freedom was reignited and this took place when the law was repealed in June 1988 after the release of Mandela and uh, more free politics in the country. At university, it was a liberal university, we didn't have pressure put on us directly to be liberal, but it was a liberal university and I'm sure conservative students would have felt out of place as opposed to Stellenbosch University, which was about 50 kilometers down the road, where the exact opposite would have occurred. I must say that Stellenbosch had the much better rugby team. <laughs> the front row was a Springbok front row most of the time. While we were students, the, the black students in our year entered uh, the medical course in 57, uh, <clears throat> the black students, the Bantu students, were forced to go to the University of Natal in Durban. But at the minister's pleasure, we had coloured students, we had Indian students, we had Chinese students, non-whites, and they were allowed to come with us. We had really very good relation with our students. One little anecdote. We were in outpatients one day and one of our Indian students, a round fat chap called Jawaharlal Ramji, Jory was his nickname, and he was splitting his sides and we said, what, what's up, Jory? He said, come here, come and have a look. And in outpatients there was a thermometer rack as they were in those days, and he said, look at that, European oral, non-European oral, rectal. We have something in common, he said. <laughs> uh, we had great teachers at, at the University of Cape Town Medical School. It was described as a Scottish institution for Jewish students because we had a huge number of Jewish students. And I put there except one, the dermatologist in our course, the, the head of the dermatology department was really awful and if you went up onto the E-floor lecture theatre and read the graffiti on the desks you'd get a little a bit of a resume like uh, Lang the racialist pig and uh, Hang Lang and but generally the lecturers made no differentiation between white and non-white students but patient apartheid was respected one, if one can use that word. Kruitzker Hospital was divided into the middle. This side was the white side, this side was the non-white side. But in the clinics, there was often a lot of mixture here in the Cape. But that wouldn't have happened elsewhere. One day in outpatients, we had a national referral centre for gastro and a lady had come down from the Transvaal for consultation and she said, oh, I've just seen something really wonderful. And uh, we said, what was that? She said, one of your white nurses walking down the passage with her arm around a colored lady. And she said, wonderful? That to her was something wonderful because it didn't happen there because there was a black hospital and a white hospital whenever the twain should meet. And if you'd asked that nurse, did you do anything wonderful today? Of course not, it would be normal practice. While there, the Sharpeville riots happened in the early 60s and that was the first time that as students we realised the power of what was going on in the black populace. And the first time that I got a picture 
of who Mandela really was and what he stood for. And this crowd of people, it's not this actual photograph, but there was Schwerzke Hospital and a big motorway coming up the side. The motorway was filled with black people carrying their sticks and chanting. It was scary. The student finally had dinner. We usually had a dinner for all the students and because of the laws that had been introduced, we were told that our black students were not allowed to attend our dinner. So we didn't have the dinner that year. We worked a lot in the slums and there were lots of slums around Cape Town. The maternity hospital in District 6 was an amazing place. I mean, wonderful obstetric uh, uh, experience. And we ran a student city mission, also in District 6. We visited people in their homes. People did home deliveries. And one of our pediatric projects was to follow a child over a few years who lived in District 6. And you could see how the child had marginal nutrition, lived in a place where siblings had nose dripping with pus and ears dripping with pus. So we really got to be amongst the population and realized that some people didn't have it as easy as we did. This on the left here is just a street view of District 6. On the right was a photograph taken from where uh, the uh, medical students stayed when we were doing our obstetrics. This uh, house here was a brothel and this house here was a shabin. Just heard the other day that shabin is an Irish word, a place where people make illicit liquor because um, coloured people did not have easy access to alcohol so they made their own and sometimes heaven only knows what went in there. We had patients coming into hospital with neurological signs that defied all description. We never knew what they'd taken. But anyhow, being a port, Cape Town's a very busy place and we really had our education in looking over that street. There'd be brawls in the street and suddenly you'd hear someone shout, here comes the law, and the street would empty and you see a police car come past in quietness and then as soon as the car had gone round the corner everybody came out again and the battles resumed in the streets. Shawco, I must comment on, Student Health and Welfare Centres Organisation. The rag like the uh, parade that the students had through the town was to raise funds for Shawco it was run by students for the population and uh, we ran uh, schools, law centres and medical clinics. While I was there, the schools and the law uh, clinics were shut because they did not want these liberal students teaching or advising the coloured population, but they did not have the goal to stop the clinics. And we had wonderful experience in the clinics. There was always medical supervision. In the second year, we did reception, records, weighing babies, that kind of thing. But of course, if somebody came into the clinic, you saw the patients that were of interest. In the third year, we did pharmacy and lab work. And fourth to sixth year, we started seeing patients. You'd see a patient as if you were the GP and then you put up your hand, the doctor would come, check your findings, and then uh, check the prescription, and they'd go back to the third year students who were checked by a pharmacist to see that that worked. It was a wonderful organization. My first job as a research fellow was in 1965. It was in an NIH-sponsored nutrition unit that was really world class, excellent unit. And on the left here, 
The second chap from the left, Whitey Whitman. It's a funny name, actually. A whitey white man, South African, uh, an Afrikaner, but a really salt of the earth type chap. And he had done work on the effect of malnutrition on child mortality, on the mortality particularly from diarrhea. And he had just finished his MD thesis, and I was taking over his job. And he submitted his thesis work to a congress in the UK for presentation. And being a state hospital, the application went through the machine. They uh, saw his abstract, and they said, sorry, you're not going. And he said, why not? He said, well, it does not present the country in a good light, so you can't go there and blacken our names. So he said, well, bad luck, then I don't go. And I'll tell them why I didn't go, and he didn't go. So there was censorship right at that level. And as I've mentioned, there was scientific censorship, there was press censorship. And <clears throat> I don't know whether you would distinguish here between a front lens front end loader, loader and a bulldozer, but when a uh, slum suburb was cleared, it was done in winter, and the Cape winters can be cold. It's a Mediterranean climate, rainy, and friends of ours, in fact, who landed up being in Auckland, went and picked up a family with a 10-day-old baby. And when they got home that evening, there was a knock on the door. Do you have these black people living in your house? Yes. Are they in your employ? No. Then it's illegal. You need to put them out. And Willem Lubber, some of you might know, he became professor of cardiothoracic uh, research in, in uh, Auckland, said, well, I invited them in as my guests. If you want them out, you throw them out. And they didn't, but you know, you're observed. And the press published in the paper that the slum dwellings were bulldozed. And they were taken to the press council and faced a heavy fine because those shacks were not bulldozed. The front end loader knocked them down, not a bulldozer. Student publications were particularly watched. The, the uh, editor of the Johannesburg Witz University student paper had a cartoon of his looking down a toilet and saying, hello, Mr. Foster, how's life down there? And Mr. Foster was the Minister of Justice. They found that this chap had traveled on a British passport the next day day he was off, gone, deported, out the country. Books, Black Beauty was banned, believe it or not. <laughs> Just showed the, and films of course were heavily censored and a lot of them banned outright. Some of our teachers, I'm sure all of you will uh, recognize Chris Barnard, an amazing chap, extremely bright, extremely hardworking, but crazy in many ways. He was a dedicated researcher, teacher, academic. Uh, <laughs> you daren't forget what he taught you, otherwise he might kill you. <laughs> Some things that he taught us, I can still recite. Uh, and of course, he was uh, linked with the first heart transplant. And there was a little bit of politics involved because what was a dead patient in those days? And Bill Hoffenberg, who I'll comment on uh, later, was the person looking after Denise Darville, who was the donor. And he said to Chris Barnard, but is she dead? No, she's not dead. And when you take her heart out, she will be dead and you will have killed her. So there was, quite, there was a delay of a day or so before the procedure was done because of going through these difficult decisions. 
Effects of fame got the better of Chris Barnard. This picture here is of Gina Lotta Brigida, with whom he, among others, uh, had relationships. And he was very well known. And when his marriage broke up, his wife was a delightful woman, his first wife, I should say. And um, the renowned British publication, Private Eye, had Chris Barnard on the cover and said that he uh, had a divorce because he kept putting organs into other people. <laughs> uh, and, but he had his heart in the right place with respect to his patients. I mean, didn't matter color of patients. And he was very good because he was above the law there. He could say what he liked. My friend Whitey Whitman at the time was a small minion and he could be bullied. But Chris Barnard couldn't. They had too much to lose. If they cut what he did, there'd be international repercussions and then they really would appear in a bad light. Dr. Raymond, we, well, everybody knew him as Bill Hoffenberg, was a senior lecturer and again, an extremely good physician and an extremely nice person. And he was banned. We were going down the main street, saw a notice of a newspaper, prominent Cape Doctor band. We bought the paper to have a look, Hoffenberg, no idea why. We knew he was liberal. He was a personal friend of Alan Payton, who wrote Cry Freedom. To this day, we don't know why he was banned. He was involved in nuclear medicine, and it was at the time when South Africa was developing its nuclear capability. Whether that had anything to do with it, that's just conjecture. We don't know. Now, what happens to you when you're banned? He was confined to a magisterial district of Weinberg near Cape Town. He could not meet with more than one person at a time, which meant he couldn't work. And he had to appear at the designated police station at the minister's pleasure, I forget whether his was once a week or once every two days or whatever. So obviously he couldn't keep up with that, so he left. And when he was banned, it was my first year as a medical registrar, uh, we felt very strongly and our senior registrar at the time was a remarkable young man called Peter Falb, who I'll refer again to a little later. And Peter said, no, we can't let this go by. We've got to do something. So we're going to write a letter to the Cape Times. And I was all for it. And I thought, ee, here I am as a Swiss citizen. I was thinking of the Johannesburg student who'd been sent back. And I went to see the Swiss consul who I knew, and he was a friend of the family. And I said to him, what do I do? And in typical diplomatic style, he said, well, I can't tell you what you can do, or what you can't do. You've got to follow your conscience, but I'd advise you not to take a leading role in any activity. So, put my signature on the letter, it went to the newspaper, came out the next day, and the names of the signatories to the letter were put in alphabetical order, and mine being BA was at the top of the list. And I thought, this is not a good start. <clears throat> the South African Medical Association called a meeting because a lot of its members said, this is absolutely ridiculous. One of our senior people banned, cut off out of his job, it shouldn't be done. So a meeting of the Medical Association was held in the Physiology Lecture Theatre, which was the biggest lecture theatre in the medical school. Uh, that late afternoon of that meeting, we were just finishing the late afternoon ward round and my consultant was a chap called Eugene Dowdell and he had the gift of the gab and he was very politically involved as well. And he was called to the phone and he came back and said, you wouldn't believe it. On the phone was Professor Van Zale from Professor of Surgery in Stellenbosch. And Professor Van Zale is very high up in Afrikanerdom. The rumor was it that he was on the Bruderbond, the, the high level of Afrikaner controllers. 
And uh, Professor Fonzeo said to Dowdell, you're going to the meeting tonight? And uh, Dowdell said, you bet. And said, you're going to talk? And he said, you bet. And he said, well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but you're not. And he said, you're going to stop me? And he said, well, I've looked up the records of the Medical Association and you haven't paid your account for the association. Therefore, you're not a financial member. Therefore, you are not eligible to speak. Thank you very much. Anyhow, we went to the meeting that evening and the SAMA meetings usually, I mean, the attendance was abysmal like so many of these medical association meetings. And I went there at the usual time and I couldn't find parking. In South Africa, the, the uh, car registration numbers are relative to the city that you come from or the town. CA is Cape Town, CL is Stellenbosch, CY is Belleville, etc. And there were all these cars from the whole surrounding area. And the place was chock-a-block full of people. Anyhow, a motion was proposed that the SAMA complain that a colleague had been banned. <coughs> and another motion was proposed by Professor Fonsale, who was in the chair, that this not be a private vote, a, uh, an anonymous vote, but that you cast your vote and signed on a piece of paper. And I was told that wasn't to find out all these liberal nasties from Cape Town, who they were, but to make sure his boys were there and that they voted properly. Because if they didn't, they would be in big trouble. From then on, uh, Hoff Hoffenberg took calls at home, and I remember phoning him, and there were clicks on the phone. Our phone was being tapped. We knew that. And then he eventually left uh, and he left to take up a post as Professor of Medicine in Birmingham and he eventually became President of the Royal College of Physicians in London. So he was an extremely distinguished man. And this was the scene at the airport when we went to wish him goodbye. These are all the students. And we went and shook hands with him one by one filed past and there was the security police mugshots. <laughs> and mingling among the crowd, there were a lot of people who were not one of us, let us say. And we knew then, you looked at their shoes and they had army issue shoes. <laughs> so you could pick out, you careful what you say next to that bloke. <coughs> The next step that came on in uh, our life was the Gastro Congress in Czechoslovakia in 1968. I just finished my MD. I submitted uh, a paper there which was accepted for presentation and it was really a golden opportunity to get into the international circle with the work I was doing. And in fact, it was there that I met the person, person who would be most influential in my whole career in gastroenterology. To, I travelled on a Swiss passport and by then Wynne and I were married and Wynne had a British Rhodesian passport and we both had, uh, Wynne had a Swiss passport by marriage. So we had to apply for a visa to get back into South Africa. So we filled in the form, sent it off. I got my visa to come back and Wynne got a letter saying, well, you filled in the form. Your father was born in South Africa and despite your being born in Rhodesia, you are South African by descent. Therefore, it is illegal for you to travel on a Swiss passport. And there's no South African representation in Prague, so we felt a little bit off there. And eventually, uh, they said, all right, they will give us a departure per or win give Win a departure permit. They really had uh, a, a thing about communism. It was almost like somebody 
from amongst us here who would go to Syria. You know, you'd become, why, why has he gone to Syria? Why has she gone to Syria? <coughs> and I went with Wynne to the ceremony and she had to raise her right hand and read off a bit of paper. I realized that I'm performing an unfriendly act to the South African government and that the minister can deprive me of my residency at his pleasure. In other words, watch it, little girl. You put your foot wrong and you're the next plane to Zurich. At that time, Wynne had never been to Switzerland. But still, that was the implication. Anyhow, we got the visas, uh, uh, at least the visas to come back into South Africa, and we picked up our Czech visas in Rome because there was no diplomatic representation. When we came back, we realized that we had been placed on the honors list, let us say. Our phone was tapped. We belonged to a number of multiracial organizations, and I remember phoning Dr. Aronsa, and we just got through and click, the phone went dead. When we re-established communication, he said to me, whose phone been tapped, yours or mine? So we were being tapped. I was called to the phone at the hospital one morning. Detective Inspector so-and-so, your car's been found on the Basutaland border. So I said, what? What's your car number? C24843? Yeah, that's a one. It's a Ford Anglia. So I said, no, it's a prefect. But he said, they could be mistaken, couldn't they? Yeah. When did you last see your car? My wife brought me to work here in the, this morning. I mean, the Sutland border was about 1,000 kilometers away. I said, it's a very good little car, but it won't get there in two hours. Uh, and he said, oh, where does your wife work? And... Uh, what does she do, etc. So gullible me told him everything. And said, oh, sorry, there must be a mistake. And when I got back home that evening, I said to him, what was that all about? And a few days before, Wynne had, who worked as a health visitor in one of the nearby slums, had taken a collection of money that they'd made to a local coloured politician who lived there and she used our car to go there and he was a nice elderly gentleman and they were both interested in gardens he invited her in for a cup of tea and they took down the car number followed it up what's she doing in there just after we got back from our usa uh, fellowship experience the students from the university had a demonstration outside the cathedral. They were actually on the steps of St. George Cathedral, which happens to be right next to the Houses of Parliament. And we still don't know whether it's something they said or that the uh, police officer in charge of the police in the area had a bad day that day, but they charged the students with their Schambach whips. And the students scattered all over the place. Some of them ran into the cathedral where they were whipped in the cathedral. That was documented. We got the first-hand story from the wife of the dean of the cathedral. She was a radiotherapist who shared the same tea room with Gastro, so we had the full story when she got out of jail. <laughs> she came back to see, see what was happening. There was all this going on. She was coming home from work. And she said to the policeman, where's Ted? Ted was uh, her husband, the dean. And they said, he's in the paddy wagon. You can't see him. So she had a handbag and she hit the policeman over the head. <laughs> and she said, I did see Ted. I sat next to him in the paddy wagon and they were both taken to jail. <laughs> and after that, the next day, there was a huge outcry. And there was a big public meeting in the city hall with overflow, with loudspeakers to the parade ground in front of the city hall. We went very early because we knew there'd be a lot of people there. And there were lots of dignitaries on the stage, colored politicians, white politicians, uh, clergy. And one of the uh, colored uh, politicians really spoke to us and forgive me if I break up when I relate the story. 
he said, oh, isn't it wonderful to see all you people here protesting? It's fantastic. And he said, you are here protesting because your boys and girls were beaten up yesterday. My boys and girls have been beaten up for months, for years. Where were you? Where were you? That is written indelibly in my brain. Wynn and I were very active in our church youth group, a group of teenagers, mostly 14 to 18, I would guess, and a young white policeman, not, not that one featured in the picture, but one that looked awfully like him, came and joined the youth group. He was the wrong demographic. He was in his early 20s, he was married, and he, we could just say welcome. He befriended us, he visited us at home, and we never knew what was going on here. And he invited us to his wife's 21st birthday party, and which was to be held at the police barracks. And we really scratched our heads here, damned if we go and damned if we don't. And we had a very distinctive car in those days. We did not want to be uh, linked with going to the police barracks because I had a lot of activity with the students and they could have put two and two together and got six and I'd have become the spy. Anyhow, we went, very awkward evening, but we can kick ourselves now. We don't know whether they went into our house when they knew both of us were away and whether they bugged our place. You know, that's all conjecture, we don't know, but that's the atmosphere you lived in. The health system was under considerable pressure. Non-white students, had been part of the picture, but now all the non-white students were not at Kruitskir. But they had shortages of nurses, so they started employing non-white nurses in Cape Town. Initially, there were no non-white nurses who were senior to white nurses in a particular ward. And <laughs> it became quite ludicrous in the operating theatre there were non-white nurses who looked after white patients once they were anaesthetized. But eventually, you know, they gave up and, and it became a mixture. Non-white doctors started coming in at Hruitskir. The first non-white doctor was a houseman, a Chinese lad, brilliant student. He got distinctions in all his subjects. He was really good. And at Kruiskir, you applied for your house jobs and they were given on academic merit. Top jobs went to the professorial firms, etc. <coughs> the non-white students were usually put in Somerset Hospital, which was a coloured hospital uh, in another suburb. But this guy was so good that the academic staff who who gave them their allocations, appointed him to the professorial firms. And then when it went through the provincial administration for ratification, they said, you can't appoint him, he's not white. And to their credit, the academic staff said, well, we've appointed him. If you don't like it, you can fire him. And they didn't. And that was the first one. But throughout the country, the screw was tightening. The Soweto riots were a real turning point. And they were started when the black people were told that all their education would no longer be in English, but in Afrikaans. And they objected to being taught in the language of people they regarded as the oppressors. 20,000 students demonstrated in Soweto. Police shot and killed many. The official death rate was 176, 
but the estimate was about 700. Whether those figures are true, we don't know. But we do know that we, looking after people of, with injuries in the hospital, always had far, far more casualties than were the official figures released by officialdom. And about the same time, the Biko affair raised its head. And the Biko affair is really pivotal in pointing out how the system really worked. Steve Biko was a colourful person, started off as a medical student at the University of Natal. He had been expelled from one school and gone to another school to finish his education. He was a very political person. He initially belonged to NUSAS, National Union of South African Students, but felt that there was some discrimination, so they formed the South African Students' Organization, SASO, which was a black organization. He was also involved with the Black Consciousness Movement, which was to uh, promote blacks as people of integrity and people who had a right to uh, the uh, privileges of white people. The ASB I've put up there is the Afrikaner Studentenbond, which was the Afrikaans equivalent of a student organization. They would not belong to NUSAS because they said that was a communist organization. Uh, and the ASB at the annual conference uh, proposed and passed a motion saying that people of colour in South Africa were a different genetic group and did not arise from mixture of black and white. Just before he finished his medical course, Steve Biko was expelled. So he never graduated as a doctor. Because of his political activity, he was banned by the government. Just like Bill Hoffenberg, he was confined to uh, King Williamstown in the Eastern Cape. He did venture out clandestinely from where he was confined. And in this picture, he's meeting with Donald Woods, who eventually wrote his book uh, about uh, Biko's life. He was involved, again clandestinely, in the Soweto uprising and the police had uh, some information on that. In August, he was caught going through a roadblock quite far from where he should have been. And he was arrested. The official uh, statement was that there had been violence when he was interrogated by the police and he was left manacled to a grid in the crucifix position for 24 hours. This came out subsequently, not at the original, so I'm giving you a canned view of what happened. I'll, I'll show you later how this became known. And there was quite a long time between his arrest and that episode. The next day, he was not moving too well, and he was incontinent, still manacled, he had slurred speech, obvious head injuries. The doctors made the mistake in inverted commas of writing in their findings that he had an extensor plantar response, which indicates that he had organic pathology either in the brain or the long tracts. And he was left naked there, chained to the grill for another day. He was seen by another doctor who recommended doing a lumbar puncture and this showed blood-stained fluid. No action was taken. The police wanted to take him to Pretoria, which was about 1,100 kilometers away, where they said they had proper facilities to keep such people. And uh, the doctors initially said he was not fit to travel, but the police persuaded them to change their opinion and he was put in the back of a Land Rover, naked and manacled, and died shortly after reaching Pretoria. The official response from the minister was he died as a result of a hunger strike. 
because of who he was and because of his contacts, an autopsy was eventually uh, allowed and they confirmed the presence of gross head injuries. Again, only after a lot of pressure from the state, an inquest was agreed, but one of the conditions of the inquest was that no criminal proceedings could result from the inquest. And the inquest verdict, in this particular case, there is no positive evidence that the deceased's death was caused by an act of omission, by an act or omission of any person. And that almost verbatim were the words of General Klaus von Leeres, who was Deputy Attorney General, in his evidence during the case. Well, as you can imagine, the medical profession was up in arms. This was really awful and a complaint was made to the South African Medical and Dental Council and the Medical Association. Both of them responded, insufficient evidence for disciplinary action. A petition was made by medical colleagues that was rejected. Francis Ames, you see in the picture here, he was a very distinguished neurologist at Hrutsky uh, Hospital. She and Professor Tobias and Jenkovo made a collection worldwide and a number of us contributed to that from around the world to pay for this case to be taken to the Supreme Court. And to his credit, the Supreme Court judge found prima facie evidence of improper or disgraceful conduct and ordered the South African Medical and Dental Council to have another inquiry. They had another inquiry and overturned the original verdict that there was insufficient evidence. But what was the verdict? Tucker, the one doctor, disgraceful conduct, the action, he was removed from medical register for three months, suspended, suspended for two years, but he was retiring the following year. Lang, his assistant, also a doctor, acted improperly, reprimanded, bad boy. A lot of the truth that came out that I can now, that I've put into the earlier part of my presentation here, came from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Here you see uh, Desmond Tutu and Alex Borain. Alex Borain was our local member of parliament in Pinelands. He was an ex-Methodist minister. He was linked to the youth group and the church we were involved with in Pinelands. And the Biko case was taken to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They recognised the shortcomings of the case and uh, two doctors and five police applied for amnesty which was denied because they did not accept personal responsibility. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said, well, how can you for be forgiven something for which you said you have no responsibility? So they recommended that they be prosecuted. Well, what was the eventual response? The decision, the decision was left to the De Minister of Justice who said, well, there were no eyewitnesses, so we can't say that you did that or you didn't do that. By then, the statute of limitations has passed, so no prosecution was possible. And you read the words here from Benjamin Frank Franklin, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. And Peter Falb, who was our senior registrar when we signed that faithful letter to the Cape Times when, when Bill Hoffenberg was banned, he was the one who wrote a full apology and presented the apology to the Biko family. And a key part of his statement was that Steve Biko's murder was the culmination of apartheid discrimination in health facilities the failure of the medical profession to respond to the banning of colleagues and the lack of training in medical ethics. 
it wasn't a lone case. Fabian Ribeiro, graduate of the University of Natal, he practiced in poor areas and provided very good service and he started noticing that he was seeing a lot of patients who gave the history of being beaten up by the police and he started making a record and made a video and to protect himself he apparently sent that video overseas which for the South African government that was a bad move. Well he was imprisoned on treason charge but because of his standing in the community they got a good lawyer and he was released. A few years later his house was petrol bombed and he survived. He had further attempts on his life but chose to stay because he said he was serving his people. And in 1986 he and his wife were gunned down in their home. In the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 97 the agents of the state who shot him said, yes, I did it and I'm sorry, and they were forgiven. Another slightly brighter story, Ramfela Mamfeli, also a graduate of University of Natal. She was an activist with Biko amongst the founders of the Black Consciousness Movement and Sasso. She and Biko got on very well. In fact, they had two children together while Biko was married to someone else. Uh, but they were both very active in the political movements. She was charged under the Suppression of Communism Act, uh, but again managed to wriggle out of that and worked in community medical service. In 1977, her medical career came to an end when she was banned and had to live in a small community. But being the person she was, she studied and she studied and she gained degrees. She must have been a good lass, so she was invited as South African Development Research Fellow to the University of Cape Town in 1984, where she graduated with a PhD in 91. In 94, she went as a sc visiting scholar to Harvard and in 1996, she was appointed as Vice-Chancellor to UCT and she left the Vice-Chancellor's job to become one of the four directors of the World Bank. So she really is a most distinguished woman who, despite her vicissitudes, made very good impression elsewhere. Interestingly, the, diplomat, the Democratic Alliance Party, the party of Helen Sussman, has many morphs along the years, in, realized that they needed a black leader. And they uh, invited her to become the leader of the Democratic Alliance, and she turned it down. And she's formed her own party called Agang, which is Build South Africa, and they currently have two members in Parliament. I want to leave a few minutes for questions, so reaching the end. Persecution by proxy. Some of you will recognise Stuart Sanders, who was Professor of Medicine and uh, Vice-Chancellor for many years. He gave the graduation address here about 25 years ago. His son, John Saunders, came home one evening and went to his letterbox, said, wait, I've got a lot of mail today, and went into his apartment and looked at this African National Congress leaflets. And his heart sank. John Saunders knew his father was in the forefront of political activity, and he had kept his nose clean. He had not been involved in politics. So, his father was out the country at the time, he was in the US, he phoned his father and said, what do I do? And his father said, well, go down to the police station, Mowbray Police Station is down the road, tell them exactly what's happened, hand in those leaflets and get a receipt, which he did. Next morning, four o'clock in the morning, we've come to search your flat. Come in, be my guest. <laughs> they got their timing wrong and uh, they slipped up. And John Saunders left the country. I mean, what, what do you do? 
So it really, and this, it's not an isolated case. There are other, Alex Bahrain's son imprisoned, a whole lot of others uh, really caught. And well, doctor immigration became a huge problem for the uh, establishment. It was a common topic of conversation. The concerns were that civil liberties were being eroded. We had fear about ongoing rule of law. There was conscription and war. Young graduates, when they finished, had to go and serve their time in the army. And I didn't realize until I started preparing for this talk that there were 1,800 deaths during the war years on the border in South Africa. There was a story of professional ethics, there was security, and of course finances. And there was no way that it looked that they were going to uh, release Mandela or change. And this is the gastro department, as it was in 1975. And the only two gastroenterologists, Solly Marks here, who was at the tail end of his career, and John Wright here, stayed in Cape Town. The rest of us all went, USA, USA, Israel. And this was paralleled in so many departments. Registrars had finished their training, they'd be gone. Plans were often made in secret, and you talk to your mates and say, oh, you know, I think we might be going. Oh, where are you going? Uh, some people accused us of being rats leaving the sinking ship. There was a depletion of clinical staff, which was a problem. I remember a really hard time was sitting in my office. Once I'd made the decision, I would met with Stuart Sanders and told him I was going. And then the next day, one of the Indian doctors who worked in Trutskur came and said, is it true? And I said, you mean that I'm going? And he said, yes. And he said, you do realize that you're leaving us to the wolves? That people like you who are leaving will be replaced by sympathizers? It really, it wasn't easy. So here we are here in Dunedin. And just as a postscript that you might like to mull over as a glossary, just a few thoughts. Although it's true that you have nothing to fear if you've done nothing wrong, it depends entirely on who defines what is right and wrong and why. Learn to recognize the slow erosions of personal freedoms. Question apparent alternative facts that we've heard so much of lately. And echoing the words of Bonhoeffer, who you see in the photograph here, German who was killed for his stance against the Nazis, silence in the face of evil is evil. Saying nothing is saying something. Doing nothing is doing something. Thank you.